Hi everyone, this is Travels with an Archaeologist. I'm the archaeologist, now let's get into the travels. So I want to start today with a quick word on comments. I do welcome them and I do read them. They are curated a bit because, you know, archaeology is a famously uncontroversial topic that inflames no opinions and sparks no conspiracies, especially on this famously friendly and tolerant internet. But overall, I really do like the comments I get. And, although I can make a few admittedly too defensive jokes about them, they do get read and they are appreciated. That being said, today's topic comes from a commenter who suggested I do the Harapan Civilization. Now, I haven't been to the Harapan Civilization myself, uh, which doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. It just means that the photos today won't be mine. It also means I haven't had a chance to walk through it myself and see things, which, believe it or not, actually does add to the context in a lot of my videos. Fortunately, I didn't really need to. I found this great website called harapa.com, which gives you a virtual tour and a lot more information. They became a far more valuable resource to me than I anticipated, so if you want to learn more, I really do highly recommend going there. For those of you unfamiliar with the term Harapan, this is basically the archaeological term for the golden age of the Indus Valley Civilization. If you still haven't heard of the Indus Valley Civilization, let's go into a quick breakdown. Briefly, the Indus Valley Civilization is, well, in the Indus Valley, which is here in Pakistan and parts of India. This is considered the first expression of Indian history and is considered a cradle of civilization. This means its civilization developed independently, without outside interference, and while there's a debate as to how many cradles there are, we can say that there are at least six that are all agreed on, and the Indus Valley is one of them. The Indus Valley has uncertain origins, but it seems to arise around 7000 BCE under the Mehergar culture making it just as old as all the other cradles of civilization. However, their most impressive flowering, like their western counterparts, was in the Bronze Age. This was known as the Harappan period. The largest known site from this period is Mohenjo-daro, but the civilization tends to be named from the site of Harappa. There are more than 2,600 known Indus Valley sites, so I want to focus on just these two, of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, and give you a general overview of this society, which we really don't hear enough about. What's even more unusual is that until the 1920s, the Indians themselves had also forgotten about the Harapans. Despite this being a cradle of civilization, its original inhabitants were all but forgotten. But in order to talk about the Harapan, we need to understand their wider world of the Bronze Age. So let's get into the right mindset. In the Bronze Age, a truly vast trade network exists with the Mycenaeans and Egyptians in the west and the Indus Valley in the east, with goods between these people traveling pretty far and pretty frequently. And just as we see hints of tin from the Alps coming to the west, we see hints of silk coming to the Indus from the east. It was a Bronze Age silk road three and a half thousand years before Marco Polo. And while a lot of scholars, including myself, have devoted a lot of attention to the western half of this route, it's only recently we've begun to examine the eastern half, which is kind of a shame on our end, because it was just as tied into these trade networks as the western half was, if not more. And it's during this Bronze Age Harappan period that we start to get some truly monumental archaeology. The Harappan period typically begins around 25 to 2700 BCE, depending on which source you're looking at and which chronology you're using. But there's not a lot we know about the details, at least not that we can read, and until recently this area just didn't get the attention it deserved. As a result, it tends to get discussed as to how it relates to Mesopotamian trade links, as Mesopotamian records do mention the Indus Valley. At least we think they do. The Sumerian records relate to us the lands of their east, named Dilmun, Magan, and the furthest east, Maluha. It's believed that Maluha is the Indus Valley civilization, but, and I should emphasize this point, it's not confirmed. But, unlike other areas where it's not confirmed, I am willing to stake my claim that Maluha was the Indus Valley. The evidence for this belief is very, very good. There are Indus Valley artifacts in Mesopotamia. Their seals have been found in the tombs of Ur, and although we have not yet found Mesopotamian goods in the Indus, I do honestly believe it is a yet. I fully expect there to be Mesopotamian goods found in a Harappan site one day, especially now that interest and funding in the area is increasing. And they shared a lot of material culture and goods. 
Both the Indus and Mesopotamia traded etched carnelian beads, and both prized lapis lazuli, which at the time was sourced only in Afghanistan. Both used cylinder seals, and both sat on the Persian Gulf, which is easily traversed, especially by the Sumerians, whom we can prove had sailing ships. And those are just a small handful of a long list of proofs. So the question isn't so much about whether or not Mesopotamia and the Indus communicated, because they definitely, definitely did. It's more about whether or not the term Maluha was the name the Mesopotamians gave to the Indus Valley. Did the Indus Valley call themselves the Maluha? Well, here we just don't know. The Indus did have a script. The problem is, we can't read it. In my opinion, the Indus script is probably the most intriguing and enigmatic thing about the Harappans. It represents the earliest form of Indian language with thousands of inscriptions from over 50 sites. But even if we could read them, it's not certain how useful they'd be. See, the longest known script is only 26 symbols long, with the average length being about 5 symbols. They're found on engravings on just about any type of material, but they seem to favor steatite for their seals. Over 400 symbols have been identified but not translated, and many researchers believe longer texts may have been written on perishable materials. Attempts have been made to decipher the script, but it's proven pretty fruitless. We do know it seems to be written right to left, then left to right one line below, going in this kind of pattern. But otherwise we know nothing, not even its language family. One recent study has suggested Dravidian based on the Sumerian word for elephant, with logic I've put up on the screen now, but it's still just a guess. And when the script fell out of use around 17 or 1800 BCE, writing wouldn't return to India for another thousand years, at which point it was using an entirely different script. But we're archaeologists. We'd be pretty silly if we let something like no writing stop us from doing our jobs. So what does the archaeology say? The archaeology of the Indus is dominated by two major sites, Mahenjadaro and Harappa. Mahenjadaro is the largest known Indus site, and it was the first one discovered, but Harappa was the first one to be published, hence why Harappa tends to get to name the culture. Mahenjadaro was mostly excavated in the 1920s and 1930s, first by an Indian man named Rakhal Das Banerjee, and then by John Marshall, who was then the head of archaeology for the British administration and published his findings in 1924, bringing the Indus civilization to the wider world's knowledge. And typical of his time, Marshall's archaeology is less than ideal. His expedition was more concerned with discovering the culture than understanding it. He was basically in a race to publish. As a result, he completely ignored stratigraphic layers, but dug down and set horizontal strips, a practice which, in fairness, was acceptable for the time. But it was nevertheless doomed to muck up the site's chronology. Because of this, a lot of artifacts from different times got mixed together with these initial excavations, leading to some erroneous assumptions. That being said, Marshall was fairly typical for his time, and he actually does deserve a lot of credit, not only for bringing in local Indians onto his excavations, but also for giving them credit. He led the first archaeological expeditions in India that Indians were actually allowed to participate in, and became a strong advocate for them in the colonial administration. Mahenjadaro is a fragile site, and thus proper excavations haven't actually occurred here since 1965. It's a fascinating site, however, with an upper city and a lower city, with the upper city being quite literally upper. It's built on an artificial platform. Why this is the case is believed to be to protect the city from flooding. But it also seems to show evidence of pre-planning, as the site was rebuilt and realigned at least once on a large scale, with the upper city matching the lower city in terms of street layouts. The upper city has often been called an elite section for the wealthy, and although on the surface this does make sense, further examination of evidence makes this assumption a little bit doubtful. Although the buildings on the upper city are slightly higher quality and built on a more monumental level, the difference is not that significant. We have poor households on the upper city and rich ones in the lower city. The site has had a couple of recent non-invasive surveys done, but this has yielded little new information. As a result, our most reliable site for Harappan society is, well, Harappa. Harappa has yielded far more recent excavations, with the last one wrapping up in 2010 under these guys, and this site has yielded some fascinating new insights and overturned some long-held assumptions. Take this building, for example, once known as the Great Granary. This has been revised, and we now refer to it as the Great Hall, as there is absolutely no evidence of either grain or storage being here. 
It may have once acted as kind of a structural base for a larger wooden building that has long since gone. This also means we need to rethink the use of these platforms, which were once called workmen's platforms for threshing grain, but now we know they're found in houses and in courtyards, giving them an as-yet-undetermined, more domestic function. Then there were these things, giant ringstones. These were once thought to have a religious significance, especially as they seem to be found on every Harapan site. But I will tell you this, there is one secret in archaeology that we try to keep quiet, and that is that if you do not know what something is, name it religious. Unless it looks sexual, then you call it a fertility figurine. Well, once we realized there was probably more wood here than initial excavations uncovered, the new theory is that these rings were actually just supports for wooden poles, in particular for gates. Mahenjadaro and Harappa are often used as models for the whole Indus Valley, but again, as you can probably guess, there's no real reason that we should be making this assumption. We make this assumption because these are the two most studied sites, with the others only coming under study in the last 50 years or so, and some... Not even then. Some are still only known from their map locations and preliminary surveys waiting on a proper expedition. Despite this, both Mahenjadaro and Harappa are very similar in some regards, and we can assume some things were typical for the whole Harappan period. For example, both these sites have some really amazing ways to move water, both for domestic purposes and for flood control. These were very advanced systems that far surpassed most of their Mediterranean and Near Eastern peers. The platformed upper city in Mahenjadaro is similar in the layout to Harappa, too, which also was divided between an upper city on a platform and a lower city down below it. Even buildings that look promising to give us some sign of societal status yield frustratingly few answers. This building in Harappa has been identified as a palace or priestly chambers, but overall there is little evidence for any sort of rank, religious or otherwise. But even though there were rich and poor, and there was some kind of social stratification, it's really hard to tell who was who and what their role would have been. Marshall noted that large houses in Mahenjadaro were built right up against smaller ones, which he interpreted as richer houses being next to poor ones, but this relies on a few assumptions. Firstly, it doesn't really account for population rise, because in later areas, we do see the larger houses being broken apart into smaller rooms to allow for more people to move in. It also assumes that each house had just one family, and assumes that they all served a purely domestic function. That being said, it's not as if this correlation is meaningless. Marshall did not by any means give a bad interpretation. And this layout does imply that you certainly had to be quite cozy with your neighbor. And more than just the architecture, artifacts also seem to corroborate his idea. There really isn't much in the way of social stratification that we can see. As I said a little earlier, there weren't even enough differences between the upper and lower cities to draw a full conclusion. And their art doesn't really help us either, because much of the city would have been built of mud, brick, or wood, so any potential wall decorations or meaningful visual displays of wealth would be long gone. It actually has been quite a strong debate among Indus experts as to how the people functioned. Was this one centralized empire like Egypt? Was it a region of separate warring cities like Mesopotamia, or was it a loose federation of like-minded cities like Greece? There is evidence for all of these in some way. These cities seem to have self-contained economies with workshops in Mahenjadaro yielding artifacts from all aspects of manufacture. But at the same time, with the cities so large as to require breaking apart of larger houses into smaller apartments, it would not have been possible to survive as a city standing alone, at least not without a very large and secure hinterland to supply it. Of course, equally, this overpopulation may also be a reason that it declined. Maybe it was unable to feed it. We could spend all day going over the unknowns of Harapan history. And believe me, I almost did. This is the short version of the script. But I think it's about time that we wrap it up with the key question as to what happened to them. Well, this is the biggest unknown of all. The Harappan period seems to have ended around 17 to 1900 BCE, depending on the source. This is because Sumerian records no longer mention Maluha following the 18th century BCE. But the Indus civilization didn't disappear. It shrank back into itself and entered its last phase, a period of localization and decline. During this period, we see a reversal of population trends. Houses become larger and sit on larger plots of land as previously crowded streets suddenly become much emptier. And by the end of this period, around an estimated 15 to 1300 BCE, the Indus do disappear in a frustratingly vague manner. 
Blame for this decline has been given to a few things, major flooding or drought being among the most often cited examples, but this was followed by the Vedic period, when Indo-Aryans entered the region and established modern Indian society. And did these Indo-Aryans destroy the Indus? Well, in the research I've done, and please do correct me if I'm wrong because I may have missed something, it seems to say no. We don't see any destruction of the Harappan phase the way we see destructions across the eastern Mediterranean in the Bronze Age collapse. Rather, it seems this was a slow decline occurring over centuries. The oldest Vedic texts date to, at the upper estimates, 1500 BCE. Although some scholars have noted there is a potential for overlap, it seems that even if this is the case, the Vedas themselves never mention it. I actually looked quite hard into possible connections between the Vedas and the Harappans, but alas, both the experts on the Vedic texts and the experts on the Indus civilization are in agreement. The Vedas only start after the Indus have finished. The Vedas are written in a different language and in a different script, but even if we assume this is a translation of an older memory, they also make no mention of anything we'd expect to see based on what the archaeology of the Indus society has told us, and the Indus society gives us nothing that would relate itself to the Vedas. Thus, when the Indus were rediscovered, it came as a surprise to the Indians themselves, as the empire had faded even from their own cultural memory. And this is the greatest tragedy of the Indus, not the collapse of their civilization, but the collapse of their legacy. What was once possibly the mightiest civilization in the Bronze Age was condemned to stagnate, fade, and be forgotten in its own world. It is haunting and humbling. I live in hope that someday someone will find a treasure trove of longer texts, crack their language, and put this society in its rightful place alongside the giants of Persia and Egypt. But for now, all we have is speculation. For now, the people of the Indus Valley remain an enigma, a monument to a forgotten past and a tempting siren song for all of us travelers looking to go off the beaten path and seek out these ruins for ourselves, left to wonder at what happened, why it happened, and who they used to be. So this video actually could have been so much longer. It was painful to cut out some of the things I'd learned for the sake of time, and I very much enjoyed learning about this. So thank you for suggesting this in the comments, and I'm glad we could learn about this together. If you're planning a vacation somewhere and want to know what archaeology is there for you to visit, leave a comment on that too. So if there are any sites you want me to look at, leave it in the comments below, and I'll do what archaeologists do best and dig something up. Who knows? Your comment might be my next video. Anyway, that's all for today. Thank you for suggesting this video, so please do like it, and remember to subscribe to my channel. The link to my Patreon is in the description below, and until next time, I'm the Archaeologist, and this has been The Travels.